today with our Excel application. Calculator would also be home game this weekend. Is that right? I got canceled. Oh, already? Okay. Um, yeah, we had to let Simon <laughs> Fraser and Oaks play. Apparently that, so. Yeah. It's supposed to snow again Friday, too. <laughs> well, that timing is everything. Yes. Between snows. So is it just going to be a normal week then? Mm-hmm. It sounds like it, yeah. yeah. Have to see what they want to do on Friday. Mm -hmm. Got a, a spring break series somewhere? Central, I think. Mm -hmm. Central Washington. Can you have Darian come and watch? I don't know. She's probably there. Probably. I think she is there. They're working. Oh, okay. So. Start. Uh, welcome. So for today, uh, we'll cover the rest of chapter eight and then do some applications. So I think the applications is really where it's at because that's the skills you're going to take with you. So uh, the application spreadsheet for today is right here. So if you go to the folder for today, you'll find another Excel spreadsheet. So. As we're doing these spreadsheets, you'll want to keep and save your work because that will really help you. Uh, on the next exam, there'll be applications that you'll be asked to do. Uh, so you'll want to have examples to look at for that. So uh, for uh, the textbook today, if you remember to bring your book, um, we are going to be using four, four different formulas. Um, from pages 144 to uh, 146 today. So uh, we'll go through those things together. So formulas uh, 8.2 through uh, 8.5 for today. So, okay. Just a warm-up question, what, what does it mean for something to be statistically significant? Uh, yes, that helps. Yeah. Yes. Less. Okay, so what else? Probability of what? 
possibility of rejecting a true null hypothesis. Is that is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you reject a true null, that's a bad thing because if the null is true, no differences, right? So uh, if you reject a true null, you've made the wrong decision. So what type of error is that? Type 1 error. So why do we use 0.05? What does that really mean? That means 5% of the time you're going to do, you're, you're, you'll have an outcome due to random chance where your statistical set test uh, says there are differences when in actuality there are not between conditions, groups, or time points. Okay, so then, uh, so probability of rejecting a true null is significant. What about power? It's kind of along the same lines, except it has to do with the type two error. Probability of rejecting a false null. Yes. So if you reject a false null, have you made a correct decision? Yes, because a false null means there are differences between time points, conditions, or groups. And so what's an acceptable level of power from a quantitative standpoint? It's hard to achieve with a small sample size. Uh, yeah, so what Jordan says is important because 0.01 means that you have a lower risk of a type 1 error, but you have a higher risk of a type 2 error. So the stricter, the stricter your alpha level means less risk of type 1, but more risk of type 2. So 1 minus power is the risk of a type 2 error. So if an acceptable level of power is 0.8, and we say, OK, 1.0 minus 0.8 is what? 2, that means we have a 20% chance of making a type 2 error where there are real differences, but our statistical test fails to recognize them. So our, our test doesn't pick those up. So uh, 0.05 kind of gives you the best of both worlds where you have uh, an acceptable uh, chance of, of not making a type 2 error, but also not making a type 1 error. So it's kind of in the middle. Okay, so uh, working with regression equations. So regression is all about prediction, predicting one variable from another. So the more relationship you have between two variables, so in other words, as the Pearson R increases, the easier it is to predict one variable from another. So we'll go through some examples. So this is uh, regression that involves the equation for a line. As you remember your high school math. And so y is the predicted score. So that's what you're trying to predict. It's also uh, called the dependent variable. Uh, X is the predictor. So that's the independent variable. So if you know what, what a score is for X, then you can predict what someone's score for Y will be. And we'll go through several examples. So the formula, Y equals BX plus A. So you take the score for the predictor variable and you multiply it by what's called the slope. So we'll go through. So B is the slope and A is the, the intercept. And so then you can come out with a, a predicted score for your other uh, variable for Y. So just some page numbers there. We'll get back into your textbook uh, when going through these examples later on. Um, so 
once again, if, if we have a very high correlation between two variables, it makes it a lot easier to predict one from the other. So you have a large sample of people. Uh, sometimes it's useful to predict one variable from another variable. So you don't have to measure every, you don't have to measure both, both variables. If you measure just one variable, then you can have a pretty good prediction about what the other variable is going to be. So um, here's a study that I shared in a, in a different class the other day, but um, it also has a lot of relevance here. Um, so comparison of multi-frequency uh, bioelectrical impedance versus dual energy x-ray absorptiometry for assessing body composition changes after, after participation in a 10-week resistance training uh, program. So the multi-frequency bioelectrical impedance is the green body that we have. And, um, if you're around, I'll bet all of you have uh, had an in-body assessment at least once. Um, so that's what this is. And so they're comparing the in-body versus the the dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, so that's the DEXA. And so the DEXA is considered the criterion, so that's, uh, that's considered the independent variable. So that's the lab-based, expensive, time-consuming, requires a certified technician and so on, whereas the in-body is relatively easy to administer, doesn't take very long. We can administer to large amounts of people. So uh, the reason we compare lab-based with other more efficient methods is, is we want the, the in-body to correlate really well with the, the DEXA method. And so um, if you, uh, I took a, a piece of the, results here and um, in terms of the change in percent body fat so over the course of 10 weeks how well did the in body assess the change in body fat versus how well did DEXA so you're correlating the change with each modality and from the results they reported a 0.75 so what is considered a strong correlation? Remember what? Seven. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, a proportional correlation, anything greater than uh, 0.7 is considered a strong relationship. So that's good news. So a uh, change in percent body fat uh, via DEXA would be similar to what the change would be for an in-body assessment. So here's a plot showing uh, each person in this study uh, looking at the predictor variable, independent variable. This is the change. Anytime you see a, a little triangle, that means change. So change in percent body fat for DEXA after 10 weeks. And then also looking at the change in percent body fat for in body. And so on the Y scale here. And so uh, the equation noted in this study uh, can tell us the, the amount of change that we can expect for the in-body given a certain amount of change in DEXA. So what I'd like you to do is take a look at this formula up here. And so, let's say that uh, you had a, let's say a 2% change for a uh, DEXA. So after 10 weeks, you found that with a, with a DEXA scan, it showed that your percent body fat had changed 2%. So that would be right here. So, you can follow this line up and it connects with the line right there 
which would be associated with about 1.5% change for the in-body assessment method. So let's, let's just do this equation real quick just so you can see how the values on one variable match up with the other variable. So, so what you'll do is your value would be 2, that would be x, if you do 2 times uh, 0.7702, and then you would subtract 0 0.0592, and uh, I got 1.48. So that's, does everybody understand how that works with this is the change, and then it comes out about right there for the, for the in body. So, so just predicting uh, one variable from another, in this case, DEXA, to predict uh, in body for the change. Okay, so this is a special slide because this is the very first study that I ever published way back in 2004. How old were all of you in 2004? Uh, I've been around a long time. So I was at, I was at Arizona State back then. Um, and then this other guy who's still at Utah State actually, about eight hours from here. Um, so very first study, it was predicting uh, 10 repetition maximum for the free weight uh, parallel squat using the 45 degree angle leg press. So how many of you have seen an old, maybe they don't make them like this anymore, but that was an old Cybex leg press sled. Okay. So I had 60 people um, and 30 of those were advanced and 30 were, were novice. And so I did a total of three predictions. Uh, this is for the novice squat. So predicting uh, squat mass from leg press mass. And then this would be your, your beta. And then this would be the intercept out here. So how much, how much you could lift on the leg press in kilograms. Uh, to predict an equivalent load for the free weight back squat. And so then this is for the, the advanced, and you can see the line really starts to tighten up versus here it's kind of all over the place, which is more, you would expect that more from a novice, um, whereas it starts to tighten up because, you know, they were pretty precise about how much they could lift and it made it a lot easier for the advanced people, less familiarization and so on. Uh, and then everybody together. Um, so um, leg press mass multiplied by this number and then add those kilograms gives you your, your squat mass. So kind of useful. Um, it was really limited to just that leg press model though because as you know, different leg press models would be more or less difficult. So, but it was good enough to, to get into a journal. Uh, so what are the procedures for uh, prediction? So first you have to identify what you're trying to predict. So that'd be the dependent variable. Okay, and then multiple regression means you're using not just one, but two or more predictors. So your predictors are your independent variables. So predictive variables, you have to have two or more if it's, if it's multiple regression. So uh, you remember when we did coefficient of determination from last week? So let me go back. So the very last thing we did on Thursday was we took our uh, we took our correlation and we squared it. So 
this shows the amount of relationship between variables. So the percentage of one variable that can be accounted for due to the other variable is the coefficient of determination. So uh, the multiple correlation coefficient is kind of the same thing. So the collective uh, correlation between the combined variables and your dependent variable. So if you take all your predictive variables together, what's the collective relationship between those and your and your dependent variable is, is what we're talking about. Okay, so multiple correlation coefficients. So the combined predictor variables and your dependent variable. Okay, so then you take the square of that and that's like the coefficient of determination. So the amount of commonality. So what is the percentage of the outcome in the dependent variable that is due to the combined predictor variables? So your prediction equation, when you have multiple variables, uh, you have just one intercept, but then you have several beta coefficients. So x1 would be your first variable, x2 would be your second, and x3, and, and so on. So each of these x's represents an independent variable. So a, a score on a certain variable that collectively contributes to predicting the dependent variable, or y. So selection procedures for multiple regression. So there's lots of different procedures. Um, <clears throat> when just starting out with, with regression, I think the best is probably the full model. So, so this is how we'll do this today, is we're, we're going to put everything in at once. So all the predictive variables we throw them into the analysis at the same time to see how well we can predict the dependent variable. Whereas some other methods, um, for example, stepwise, you'll put in one variable, see what you get in terms of prediction, and you, then you put in a second, see how those two combine to predict, and so on. So I think it's easiest just to see how everything works all at once, and then see what you get as the outcome. So let me show you a couple of uh, examples and then we'll get into our application. So uh, this is a study that is often cited to predict muscle cross-sectional area. So muscle cross-sectional area is sometimes thought of as, as a way of uh, predicting strength because a, a muscle with a higher cross-sectional area will have higher strength. Um, so it's oftentimes used in studies because not everyone has access to an MRI machine. So if we can predict muscle cross-sectional area from other variables, okay, so in this case, um, mid-thigh circumference in centimeters, so everybody understand what circumference would be. So maybe some of you had, have had a mid-thigh circumference measurement. So around the, the middle part of your thigh there. Uh, and then anterior thigh skin fold is another predictor. So, so in this case, what we have are two predictor variables. Okay, so mid-thigh circumference, anterior thigh skin fold, and we're using those to predict your dependent variable is here, so quadriceps cross-sectional area. So a few years ago, I had a student that did their uh, thesis on this. So they were able to do a training program, and uh, we don't have an MRI machine. So this is a really great way that's been validated against MRI to be able to get a measure of cross-sectional area by taking these other measures that are 
easier to get. So quadriceps, uh, hamstrings, and then total thigh muscle cross-sectional area. So you've got, uh, so you'd have X, which would be your mid-thigh circumference times, this would be your first beta coefficient, 4.68, and then you'd subtract the product of 2.09, that'd be your second beta coefficient, multiplied by your anterior thigh skin fold in millimeters, and then your intercept is out here, minus 80.99. So notice the, the R values here. So those are pretty high R values. So this would be the multiple correlation coefficient. So see the R between collectively the mid-thigh circumference and anterior thigh skin fold, collectively those two variables are related to quadricep cross-sectional area of 0.86. So that's pretty high, that's a pretty strong relationship. And then the hamstrings equation was 0.75, and then your total thigh cross-sectional area was 0.86. So you could get a, a pretty accurate estimate of what an MRI would tell you on a, on a thigh cross-sectional area just by taking uh, these measurements and going through the equation. So it's a convenient research tool. So a lot of schools uh, may not have an MRI uh, access, MRI access, and so this makes it easier to do really good research. So these are important. Um, okay, so let's get into our practical part. Um, so if you'd be willing, let's head over to our practical exercises for today. So uh, what we've got to start off with, so this is our, our regression number one. So remember Y is what we want to predict and X is the predictor. So we're trying to form a, a regression equation that predicts how much mass in kilograms that can be lifted for a back squat based on the score for a front squat. So this is your predictor, and this is the variable that is, that is being predicted. So to make a, a regression equation, you have to have scores on both variables for your sample. And then what you can do is you can cross-validate your equation on a different sample of people to, to see how accurate it is. So, uh, so let's start off with, so there's, there's some things on here that you'll already know how to do. Let's start off with our, and start working on this together. So, uh, the mean. The mean should be that. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we go equals average. And then just like we've done before, we just get an average for that column. And then uh, as, as we've done before, you can just drag over to get your for the other side. So it's pretty fast, and then your standard deviation, uh, as, as we've done before, STDEV dot S, right? So you can figure that one out. Just like that. Drag this over. So you got your your mean and your standard deviation for both sets of scores. Um, so Pearson R. So how do we do that one? Remember? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So just type in the uh, in a P and then we'll double click on the Pearson. And you can take your first column here and then 
comma, and your second column, and just like that. So, so is there a strong relationship amongst these people? Yeah, it's, it's not perfect, but looks like as, as one score goes up, the other one also goes up. Okay, so now we get to our equations so that we can make a line out of it. So our first equation is uh, 8.3. So we want to take note of 8.3. And I haven't, haven't got it memorized, so I need to look here. So we're figuring out the beta coefficient that will multiply our front squat score by. So let's put in equals. So it looks like we need to take our Pearson R. So we can just click on that. And then it looks like we multiply by the ratio of our standard deviation scores. So Place an asterisk there to multiply. And then it's, so it looks like standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. So we can take that one divided by standard deviation of x. It's that one. Up with 1.11. So I want you to read what I've written out there to the side. So what, what that means exactly is for every one kilogram change in front squat, there would be a reciprocal change of 1.11 kilograms in back squat. So why does that make sense? How many of you have done both. Which one can you do more? Back squat, yes, you're right. So this should be, our beta coefficient should be uh, greater than one because you'll do more with the back squat. So for every one kilogram change in front squat, there's a reciprocal change of 1.11 kilograms in back squat. Okay, so our intercept, okay, so now we're looking at Bottom of page 144, so we're looking at this next equation. Bottom of page 144, so let's put this in here. So looks like we need a couple of means here, so equals. And it looks like the mean of y, so we can click on that. Going to subtract, and it looks like our beta coefficient multiplied by the mean of x. So we need to have a parentheses in here. So our beta coefficient is right here, and then multiplied by the mean of x. Close parentheses. Okay, so that's that's going to be our intercept on our equation. Okay, so very last thing, standard error prediction. So this is how much on average the prediction equation will be off. So if you if you're trying to predict someone's back squat from their front squat, the standard error prediction will be how far on average each prediction is expected to be in error. So how far off is the prediction? So if you go over the page, there's this very last equation from today right here. Right at the top. So you have to be, this one's a little tricky on um, getting it into Excel. Um, so we'll Let's do this together. So, um, looks like we've got the standard deviation of y. So, standard deviation of y is that one right there. 
and then it's going to be multiplied by the square root. So remember in Excel, how do I how do I take the square root of something? SQRT. Yeah, SQRT. SQRT. And let's open our our parentheses here because we've got to take the square root of one minus r squared. So r is our uh, Pearson correlation. So let's go uh, one minus, and you can click on your Pearson correlation. And then how do I square something? Carrot. Yeah, carrot. That's right. Yeah. And then two. So that gives you your, your standard error prediction. There, so it comes out right there. Okay, so let's write our prediction equation. So, so if we wanted to predict uh, back squat from front squat, we could say uh, the, the beta coefficient is 1.11 multiplied by x plus your intercept is 11.63. So let's just try that maybe with a just an arbitrary value here. So um, anybody know offhand how much they can front squat one time? I have about a week to find it. Okay, not surprised. Uh, okay, so, but it's in kilograms, right? So we've got to, how do we convert 365 to kilograms? That's the other way. Yes, 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 divide by 2.2. So you got your kilograms, and then you multiply the kilograms. So I got 165, roughly, kilograms multiplied by... Uh, 1.11 and then adding 11.63 will give you the kilograms for a back squat. Did everybody get 195 kilograms for that? Yeah, so then how, do, how would I convert 195 back to pounds? Yeah, 2.2, so that would give you a 430 pound uh, back squat would be our prediction. That's higher than that. So, <laughs> so prediction is not perfect, but it's within the ballpark. So, uh, in fact, uh, the average error prediction is 13.78. What's 13.78 kilograms converted to pounds? Is it exactly? So we're still going to get some from the from kilograms to pounds. Uh, yes, thirteen point seven eight to pounds. Thirty point three. So what's? So that'd be an error. Four hundred and thirty pounds plus what? Thirty point three would be this. The average error would give you around four sixty ish. Kind of give you a little bit closer value. So. Everybody good so far on prediction? Okay, so what I'd like you to do is go to our second one. Okay. So I want to be able to predict, I want to pre predict total body percent fat just from one simple measure of anterior thigh skin fold. So if you know if you know what the anterior thigh skin fold is using standard procedures, are you able to predict the percentage of uh, body fat? So go ahead and run through, run through this one on your own. Exact same steps. Yeah, 
Yes, I do have a. Anybody like to borrow the book? Yes. All right. Here you are. Or you can just go back to our first spreadsheet to get the formulas. Answer that question there too. So, if an individual has an anterior mid thigh skin fold, spelling error there, skin fold of 15 millimeters, what would be their estimated? I have another spelling error. Oh, just been doing this late. So, if an individual has an anterior mid thigh skin fold of 15 millimeters, what would be their estimated percent body fat? Is the question based on our prediction of closure. What'd you get? Okay, so go, yeah, I do. Try the your equation with the 15. percent minus 15 percent hmm. yeah everybody getting similar yeah
in this case, you'd want to make sure that you really follow your standardized procedures because we only have one thing to use to predict something else. Take a few minutes to, to finish up that one and then we'll move on to multiple regression. How many of you, when you go under the data tab, have a data analysis right out here to the side? It's not here now, up here, but how many of you have a data? Okay, great. Anybody else? Yes? Okay. How many of you need a few more minutes with the uh, percent body fat one? <laughs> Fit, are you ready? You're going okay. Not you. Uh, Megan, how are you doing? Are you doing good? Is everybody ready for uh, multiple regression? Okay, so here's the first thing. So if you don't have a data analysis option, so data analysis, if you have that option, it will appear right over on your right. So you can see up here, it's not here yet. Uh, so if you don't have it, like up here, uh, you can go to File. Once you go to File. And once you go to File, you can go all the way down to Options. So right at the very bottom, there's that choice, Options. So from here, what you'll want to do is go to add-ins. And then right at the very bottom, once you go to add-ins, so how many uh, are going through these steps? So, okay, so you're, everybody is okay. What is the recorded? Okay, so you don't you don't have the file choice. Okay. I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, how many of you show of hands are able to get to this screen? Okay. Alright, so if you are able to get here, then you just go to this drop down menu. Maybe scroll up and go to file, like on your left where I can see it that way. Options, if there's one. Maybe properties. Okay, so what you're going to select is Excel add-ins and go. And then the one that we want is this. Oh, it's under tools. Oh. Up there it says Excel add-in at the bottom. Thank you. Thank you, Bree. That was awesome. I wouldn't have been able to figure that out. So what we want is the analysis tool pack. You can get that up there. And then just click OK. And so magically, now you have a Whole bunch of other options. So you've got your. So how many have the data analysis now? Okay, Allie, can you look up or did you get it, Allie? Is it like um, Maisie's? Bree, you found it under tools. Yeah, but that was for a MacBook. Yes. Okay. 
Do you have a thing that says analysis tools in the corner here? Go through. Let's go to multiple regression. So this is our our very last spreadsheet. And so now what we've got are three predictive variables. So we've got uh, body mass, we've got front squat, and we've got percent body fat. So three predictors that we're using to predict the 1RM back squat. So mass, front squat, kilograms, and percent body fat. So we're gonna make a, a regression equation uh, taking into account all three of these to come out with our uh, back squat prediction. So the way that you do that, uh, it's actually really, So maybe somewhere out of the way, maybe like this cell right here, H3. Put your cursor in, in H3. And then let's go ahead and go over to data analysis. So we're going to be using this more and more because the analyses are, are going to get a little more complicated with t-test and ANOVAs and so on. So this is something we're going to be using a lot. Uh, so you can scroll down, and eventually you're going to see a regression. So that's that's what we want is is this regression choice. So you can select that and then click OK, and we've got this whole box to fill out and so let's do this together so your Y uh, is going to be what's predicted so what you'll do is you'll just click on this little black arrow with the underline underneath it you can just click on that and then you can scroll over and you'll want to in this case you'll want to get everything so the label not the Y, but just the label, 1RM squat in kilograms all the way to the bottom for that. So you can pick up that label and it'll go all the way down. And so once you've highlighted all of that, you can then hit enter and it will take you back to your entry screen. So now for X, it's going to be very similar. Um, what makes it nice is you don't have to do all of them together, or you don't have to do all of them separately. It's easy, it, it's really easy, you just do all of them together, including the labels. So you would go here, and cross, and then down so you can see how all of your predictor variables uh, with the labels are are highlighted and then you hit enter you've got it okay so for our output um, nice to have labels so you'll want to click uh, the labels box you want to include those uh, and then before we get to output, let's go ahead and click on residuals. That will tell you how far off. Um, so each of these is a person. And so clicking on residuals will tell you how far off each person's score is. Um, so 
if they're if they in reality if they squat one hundred and seventy five pounds for a back squat how far off is the prediction using all three of our predictor variables that's what residuals would tell you and then for output let's just go ahead and click on output range and then we have the box there so click on that and you, then you can tell Excel where everything's going and we we already decided on H3 so you can click return okay, so any questions at this point everybody good okay all right so at this point you go ahead and click OK and we come out with the big big tables so So you can see, so multiple R is 0.99. Is that good? So what does that mean? What's a multiple R, just from our lesson today? So taking all of our predictive variables together, so what are our predictive variables in this case? It's body mass, front squat, percent body fat. So taking the combined effect of all those together, all three of those together have a relationship of 0.99 with back squat 1RM is what that means. Um, so coming down, we're not, we haven't talked about ANOVA yet, so we'll save that for another day, but um, to widen a column, you just go up here, kind of widen that column just a little bit, so you get that cross there and then you can widen it out. So you can see your coefficients as well as the intercept. So this is what you want to see right here. So the intercept, that's for your line. Your intercept is right here, 20.40. And then your, your beta coefficients for each of our predictor variables. So body mass, the beta is, you can see right here, front squat. The beta is right here, and percent body fat, uh, the beta is right here. So, so let's let's go down here to residuals. So I need to actually widen that just a little bit more. Let's see. Okay, so remember we we said that for participant number one, their actual uh, 1RM back squat was 175 kilograms. So with our equation, if we go down to residuals, they're predicted using, using the equation. We'll, we'll put together that equation in just a minute, but with the equation, their predicted 1RM back squat is 173.52, whereas their actual is 175 kilograms. So the residual is how far off. So one, 173.52 and whatever uh, subtracted from 175 is going to give you a residual of 1.47 and so on. So does everybody understand what a, what a residual is? And so this is how far off your prediction would be. So in the other spreadsheets when we calculated the standard error of the estimate or standard error of the prediction that's that's the standard deviation of the residuals the standard deviation of residual scores is what that means so for example if you were to take this column right here of residuals and I say stdev.s I take the standard deviation of residuals. That's the same thing we were doing in those other spreadsheets. So the standard de standard error of the prediction, standard deviation of residuals is, is what we see right here. So how far off, off on average is the predicted one or in back squat? Okay, so that's up there. So the question, uh, 
uh, if an individual has a body mass of 90 kilograms, a front squat 1RM of 100 kilograms, and a percent body fat of 12%, so put that in decimal form, which would be what? 0 0.12, what would be their predicted 1RM back squat? So I want you to, uh, using your using your coefficients and your intercept, I want you to make an equation for that. So Y is your 1RM back squat equals, and then you have a score for body mass, and you have a score for front squat, and you have a score for percent body fat, and you're multiplying those scores by each of these respective coefficients. And then you add the intercept to get your predicted 1RM back squat. So it's just the same as, as a single regression, only you're just working with more predictors. You still have just one intercept. So let's see, let's Copy and I can just paste the values right under here. And so we've got, we've got our values there. So y is equal to Round these to just the two decimal places. X plus point nine four multiplied by X plus thirty one point three six multiplied by X and then plus twenty point four zero our prediction equation. So knowing that, then you can multiply a body mass of 90 by 0.13. You can multiply a front squat of 100 kilograms by 0.94. You can multiply a percent body fat of 12%, so 0.12 times 31.36. And then you add your intercept, 20.40, to get your predicted 1RM back squat. So, so 0.13 times 90 kilograms for body mass plus Kilogram front squat times 0.94 plus 12% body fat, so 0.12 times 31.36 is our coefficient. place here, so let me try this again.
Okay, I got 129.86 kilograms, which will convert to 285 pounds for the back squat um, with a 225 pound front squat plus the percent body fat and body mass factored in. So. Everybody get 129.86? Okay. Everybody understand multiple regression versus single regression? Any questions? Okay. So Thursday, I want you to work on your proposals. Um, we had a request because of so many midterms. I'm just going to hold that off. I'll, I'll give you till Friday night to turn that in. Uh, Thursday, I will be in my office. If you have questions during class time, if you need some help with your proposal, uh, please don't hesitate to come by. Uh, but uh, other than that, um, if I don't see you, um, have a good spring break. Okay. So when's your proposal due? Friday night. Friday night. Okay. Thank you. Make sure you save this because you'll need it on the on the next exam.